Hello, everybody. Thanks for um, joining us for this very special occasion um, for a tribute to Itilad Nen. I'm Hiba Amin, the visual arts curator for the Mizna Journal. And it's my pleasure to be a moderator for this discussion with our stellar speakers today um, for this particular tribute um, for the prolific thinker, writer, artist, philosopher, Itilad Nen. Um, she was a mentor, a friend, a comrade, and touched many, many people, as was evident. Um, I particularly noticed uh, the outpour of <clears throat> tributes that came out um, um, last year. It's the one year, uh, it's been one year since her passing. And so um, she touched and inspired so many people. And so today we're, we're speaking about the impact of her work. Um, from three people who've had personal um, experiences and were personally touched by her. Um, and today, uh, with I'd like to introduce our guests. And our first speaker is Andrea Abikaram. Um, Andrea is a trans Arab American punk poet performer cyborg. Um, they are the author of Extra Transmission from Kelsey Street Press from 2019. And with Kay Gabriel, they co-edited We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans um, poetics from Nightbook Books from 2020. Their second book, Villainy, also from Nightbook Books 2021, reimagines militant collectivity in the wake of the ghost ship fire and the Muslim ban. Uh, joining us today is also Qasim Ali, um, who met Etel Adnan in 2008 and became her publisher not long after. A translator and poet, he co-founded Nightboat Books and currently is a professor and chair of the Department of Literature at the University of California, San Diego. And lastly, we have with us Amar Barada, who's a writer and curator whose work focuses on the politics of translation and intergenerational transmission. Recently, he published the poetry collection, Clonal Hum, and co-edited La Septième Porte, Ahmed Bouanani's posthumous history of Moroccan cinema. He teaches at the Cooper Union, New York, where he co-organizes the IDS lecture series. Thank you very much to the three of you um, for joining us on this special occasion. Um, I'd like to open up the conversation um, really uh, just from a personal perspective, um, would love to hear how um, each of you came to meet Etel Adnan or, or came to develop a relation with either her personally or her work um, and um, where it kind of went from there. So perhaps, um, Qazim, can we start with you? Sure. Um, I actually uh, encountered Etel probably like most people would normally do, um, encountered her first through her work. Um, I used to haunt the St. Mark's Bookshop in, in, uh, in New York, which was not very far away from where I was in graduate school at NYU. And uh, it's not there anymore. It's a coffee beanery now, unfortunately. But um, the poetry section there always held um, um, books by small presses, including Post Apollo Press. And uh, Etel had a book called There. And it was in the poetry section, but it was prose and it was sort of lyrical and philosophical. I mean, I was immediately captivated uh, and kind of just devoured her work. And at the time I was um, translating uh, from French and traveling to Paris um, almost every summer and every winter. And Marilyn Hacker was a friend of mine. And at some point I brought up Etel's name to Marilyn Hacker and Marilyn said, oh, well, she's, you know, she lives here in Paris. She's, you know, very friendly. You should just reach out and see if, you know, she's around, you can meet with her. And I'd never really had that sort of experience of someone is just gonna meet a random person, but, um, you know, Marilyn shared with me, Simone Fatal, um, Etel's partner, Marilyn shared with me Simone's email and said, um, Etel doesn't have email, I just write to Simone and, and ask. 
And that's what I did. I wrote and I said, I'm in Paris. It would be so wonderful to meet Etel. And I just got this email back, you know, come on Thursday at two. And so with the address there. And so I went and, um, you know, the apartment was full of people. Etel was sort of sitting in her chair and everyone was, you know, around her. And they were there when I got there. Then people left, new people came. I mean, it was just this sort of, it felt like, a salon like Gertrude Stein style or something like that. And um, it was just magical because she was, you know, engaged in these conversations about philosophy and poetry and politics and fashion. We talked about clothes and she was speaking in Arabic with one person and French with someone else and English with someone else. And just sort of like, uh, it was just a really dynamic, incredible space. And of course, everywhere in that apartment from floor to ceiling, were her paintings and then Simone who was a sculpturist there her sculptures were all around so it was just this I mean it was like being in fairyland with two fairy godmothers <laughs> this was really striking about a lot of the tributes it's these this personal connection and it and it seemed evident that they were open and they opened up their home to many people including people they had never met before Awad it seems that you had a kind of similar experience with how you met them yeah, I recognize a lot of what Kazim is saying. For me, it was actually I I met Etel before meeting her work, so it was a, a kind of I was very young. I was in my early twenties. This was twenty years ago, a little more than twenty years ago. Um, and it was the context was um, in an abbey, a few maybe 20, 30 miles north of Paris, the Abbey de Royaumont, which was a Cistercian abbey very old building that had been turned into a foundation where um, there was a lot of music happening, but also they had a language and translation department in the activities they did at this abbey. And so what they did is they would invite, uh, say, a poet who, write, who writes in some language other than French and gather around them a few people who write in French, not necessarily translators, but writers in the French language, who would all together in the course of one week spent together, working, eating, drinking, et cetera, uh, collectively translate the work of somebody. And so it was the first time I was invited. Um, I was very young. I, I don't even know if I considered myself a writer, but I had started translating some American poetry into French after a year spent in New York as a student. And there I was sitting around the table um, in a group of translators that included Etel and Simon. Um, and so, so I got to know them by spending a week with them in this um, 13th century abbey uh, north of Paris. So I remember, and, and I felt, it, it felt, you know, Etel was in her late 70s, I was 21, and it were 23 or something. And there was this sense of encountering, I don't know if it was aunties or mothers or grandmothers, or but it was this, there was this sense, I think, Kavim, I think in your, in your piece in Mizna, you, you talk about her as, you, you say, you know, Simone at some point, Etel or Simone, Etel asks, tells Simone at some point, shall we adopt Kazim? And I think that's, that's something like that that happened, you know? So they adopted me and I lived in Paris, which means that from then on, I was always in that apartment. Um, so they would invite me and say, well, come for dinner. And then I would come for dinner and there would be 20 other people uh, there for dinner and all living legends, essentially, just you know, talking, sharing meals and living legends in the sense, not necessarily of people who were very famous, but people, um, people who, whose work had weight. And uh, and whose work Etel and Simone respected, you know, it could be an Iraqi musicologist who is preserving whatever is left of the Iraqi maqams. It could be, and not not very many people would know that person, but they had this constellation of people that was also, uh, a, you know, a, a, the that that recomposed the worlds in which they they lived and circulated. I mean, what an incredible community it sounds like that they, they built around themselves. Um, Andrea, you kind of came across Etel's work in a, in a bit of a different way. How, what was your relation? 
That's right. It's wonderful to hear these stories, though. Um, I came across Atel's work first when I was doing my MFA at Mills. I was trying to write about global capitalism and the war on terror, and I was having a really hard time making it feel intimate or like having any sort of emotional layers. It's feeling very distant. And my mentor and thesis advisor, Juliana Spar, suggested that I read Atel's book, Sit Marie Rose which was kind of this like mind-blowing experience for me because she writes about the civil war in Lebanon from this perspective of the classroom and the walls coming down around the classroom and like the war invading this like intimate space of learning and her ability to talk about large-scale violent phenomena in, in a way that's immediate for the reader and for anyone who encounters it. I find like very, very powerful as a method of writing. And so I'm always striving for that in my work. And then when I finished my first book, Extra Transmission, I didn't have, I didn't know her. I sent a cold email to Simone and wrote her this love letter to Atel and asked her to blurb it. And she wrote back within like less than 12 hours with this amazing blurb. And I thought it was so generous. And I feel lucky to have had that experience and that um, her voice lives um, as part of my first book, Extra Transmission. Uh, all those stories are so, so wonderful. And um, Qasim, you actually were her publisher. Um, and, and, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about um, a little bit more as the three of you are writers, um, it, it speaks about this idea of writing as drawing. Um, and I'm curious as, as her publisher, how you kind of engaged with that or interpreted that. Um, I like that idea of, 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 do you say drawing is writing or writing is writing? Writing is writing. drawing, writing is drawing. Yeah, although in her case, the drawing is also writing, which I think is really interesting. Mm. Um, and, you know, her work wasn't always legible. I mean, she was writing she was writing poetry, books of poetry, but they were not really, um, I don't think she hit the kind of like that spark of genius until she left behind that form of the typical lyric poem and entered into, um, so she had written prose, um, including Set Marie Rose, the novel, and her earliest work was actually in journalism. Um, and then she had published some poetry as well, early with um, Post Apollo Press, which of course Simone founded, gave up her career and founded the press in order to publish Atel's work and then came to publish many, many other people's books. So that's another kind of um, community building um, that happened of course, Post Apollo Press. But um, she then sort of went into this really sort of hybrid form between prose and poetry that had essayistic components um, poetic components, um, lyrical passages, memoir. And those books, I think, are her, you know, genius books. That's like Paris When It's Naked and Of Cities and Women and There, the book that I mentioned. And then she started to with Night Boat. So after she published In the Heart of the Heart of Another Country, which was sort of this memoir in fragments that she published with City Lights, we... Um, were at that time kind of expanding Nightboat a little bit. In the early years, we were very small and only publishing maybe two, three books a year. And Stephen Motika had actually come on and taken over from me as publisher and director of the press. So I, I wasn't writing the press anymore. And it gave more time to think about, you know, who should we be publishing? And Atel's name was at the top of that list. And since I was in Paris already when we were having this conversation, I actually brought it up and I said, you know, what do you think? Would you want to do books with Nightboat? And so we did. We picked up her. She was doing at that time a trilogy, which turned into more than a trilogy, but um, she'd done seasons with. Um, post Apollo and then she did Sea and Fog which were the second and third books of that sort of trilogy but then it kept continuing and we kept doing more and more books with her and they're all books in that same format aphoristic short small um, prose bits that kind of 
assemble into a whole. They're not even in separate chapters. And some of the books are quite small. So it's not really even a genre that exists in American English or English English for that matter. I mean, I feel like it's a very French genre and a very Arab genre. I mean, it's uniquely, um, and it's and it's uniquely hers as well. Um, she really, really pioneered that. And even as a visual artist, she, and you can see on the cover of the, of the Misnet journal, you can kind of see she's working in abstraction. Um, people always used to compare her visual art to Hans Hoffman, and she didn't really go for that comparison. I mean, visually, you can look at that and say, oh, okay, I see Hoffman with the color and the spit and the, the, the blocks and everything like that. But the difference is she was working um, from objects and to objects still. So the comparison that she liked better was the French painter, um, the Russian, excuse me, who lived in France, painter um, Nicolas de Stael. And she, she because de Stael too was what he was painting landscapes, mountains, the ocean, but he felt so, he, he even, there's this great quote from him where he says, um, the blur between objects is so deep that these objects are constantly coming each other. How can you paint realistically? You almost have to paint in abstraction. And I think that's how she was in ideas, in writing. It's that she never fixed an idea, you know, pinned it down and put it behind glass. It was always evolving. It was always um, metamorphosizing into something new. And I think she found a literary form uh, that could hold that. Interesting. And Omar, you also talk in your essay about um, uh, some of her earlier work and her love for um, other forms like artist books, her uh, Leporello's. Um, and, and I think you've written an essay about those works for an exhibition at the Pompidou as well. Um, and so how do, how do you engage with this, with this concept um, or, or, or how do you interpret this concept um, of Etels' writing as drawing? Yeah, there was this exhibition at the um, at the Pompidou in Metz, actually in, in France, just last year. Um, that was called, I think, um, "Écrire c'est dessiner." You know, writing is drawing, and I think Etel said both. She said, "Writing is drawing, and drawing is writing." I mean, there was a, some kind of an equation there. And that exhibition was not an exhibition of Etel's work per se. It was an exhibition that was. I think the, the line says something like um, curated with the complicity of Etel Adnan. So it's like an exhibition for which the curator took Etel's uh, phrase and Etel's work as a kind of point of departure. Mm -hmm. And it included some of her Leporello, some of her accordion books, but also work by a lot of different artists from different geographies and, and periods from the collections of the Pompidou and other uh, essentially French museums that um stage this kind of coexistence or continuity between uh writing you know alphabets or, or words or phrases and the gesture of drawing i think in the case of of etel um the leporellos are really interesting because they they bring together something of her aesthetics but also something of her of her politics very strongly um i mean famously she explained in an essay that when she so she first you know she grew up in Lebanon and then she went uh, to Paris in her 20s studied at the Sorbonne for three years and then got a fellowship to go do graduate school in the U.S. so she found herself at UC Berkeley in January 1955 and uh, until that point I mean her English was really rudimentary she was a writer in the French language uh, and a student of French literature, uh, and she had been educated in French, even though she knew other languages. Um, but that was also the time when the, um, the, the Algerian War of Liberation was going on, and when France was um, uh, kind of being, like the French, um, uh, yeah, the French Empire was being violently repressive against Algerians with all that we know about torture and all of that. So Etel decides that she cannot write in French anymore, that writing in French would be complicity with, with France uh, and against Algeria. 
Um, but she couldn't write in English yet, really, because she didn't have the, the mastery of the language. And she couldn't write in Arabic really either, because though she knew Arabic as a spoken language from growing up in Beirut, she had been educated in a context where uh, learning or speaking Arabic in school was forbidden in the nun school where she went. So she invented this idea of painting in Arabic as an alternative to writing in French, um, thanks to her encounter with somebody called Rick Barton uh, in San Francisco, who introduced her to these Japanese accordion books and this idea that you could write and draw and paint at the same time on these um, on these pages that that keep unfolding. So, um, so what she did with that was was very beautiful because she she her all of her first accordion books were um she would take poems by uh arab poets who were her contemporaries and copy them with her own handwriting into uh, the leporellos and then accompany them uh with visual work uh color drawing line and and when you look at her production of, of leporellos it really looks like the moment when you could you could see it as a moment when painting agrees to or consents to the kind of linear unfolding of writing. You know, she often said, you know, writing happens in time. There is there is a, a succession of time, whereas a painting, and she made these very small paintings always, is something you see in one go. It's like one apparition in a way. And the leporellos are this place where where both are happening at the same time, where where writing appears as a visual. Um, activity and uh, painting or the visual or drawing kind of unfolds in time. It's like uh, it's like the leporellos are these slowed down drawings in a way, you know, like it's um, it's um, and I don't think it's it's only because a poem requires space, you know, that it needs to be written over a number of pages, but also perhaps that this project of painting in Arabic is also a way of finding a kind of continuity in time and space, you know, like like reconnecting with something that was not always present to her or that was no longer present to her because of exile. I mean, I read that she was also um, similarly speaking about weaving and tapestry in a similar way of the image being produced line by line, um, as opposed to capturing the image um, in its entirety. Um, and as far as I know, she did a handful of, of tapestries um, and the Liparellos, um, is it true that they were kind of earlier in her artistic life, she was kind of working on these um, accordion books? Was she, was she also doing them later on in life? And I'm curious why she kind of didn't continue with these, um, with these media that she felt kind of strongly connected to. Or at least she's known more for her paintings than she is for her weavings and her artist books. I think that probably has to do with the art market rather than with her own production. I mean, she she has continued doing Leporellos. And she has a okay. end. Yeah, she's she's done. She's it was, it was a form that was always very dear to her. Yeah, because it's she liked the the tension of it. She would say. You know, it's and Leporello could have you know many many pages. It could be something that unfolds over several feet. You know, uh, but she said you, it's a there's a tension in making one. You can't stop and then take it up later. You do it kind of in one go in a way because um, because it needs to hold that that tension, the tension of a painting, but over all of these pages in in, in a kind of way. And she did it. No, she did it from the early sixties. And I think the the probably the, the last ones were probably from her last year. I mean, I haven't seen the, the last ones, but I know that just a few years before she died, she was definitely still making them. Okay. And they changed in form. So the, the, I said the early ones were all a kind of connection to Arabic poetry, the, a painting in Arabic, as she said. But then their, their forms varied. I mean, she did some using uh, texts by other poets in the English language. She did some that had no language that were only drawings or motifs or signs. Um, so it became a whole a whole a genre all in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And the tapestries, I think she, 
actually I have it here, one of my favorite books by Etel, which is not a very well-known book, is this one. It's called La Vie est un tissage. And it was translated into English. It's called Life is a Weaving. And um, it's a set of letters that she wrote in 1968 uh, to a friend of hers. I don't know who this person is, but a friend who was um, called Claire Paget, who was living in Beirut at the time. And she writes these letters from California um, during the time when she was uh, teaching at Dominican College in California. And, and she took weaving lessons. No, she took lessons um natural dye lessons uh it was a workshop it was a weekly workshop for 10 weeks and after each workshop she would send a letter to this friend in beirut and in the first letter she says i will send you letters after each workshop so that um, you can keep a record of what i'm learning here so that someday in beirut we will start a workshop of weaving and natural dyeing uh, and it's it's extremely beautiful, all that she says, because it's at the same time some technical knowledge about natural dyes uh, and at the same time various notes about living in California, you know, going to jazz concerts, thinking about um, thinking about how um, um, you know, Native Americans used, uh, natural dyes in certain places, but but the end, but also the effect of say um, atomic testing on on some of that. So it's it's a this kind of in the form of letters to a friend, much in the same way as the better known letters to Fawaz that she wrote in of cities and women. The this kind of mix of the very personal, the very quotidian, and the the cosmic and the political in a way, and the and yeah. the. And the weaving for her was really interesting because, as she said, you, you will, you never see the piece until it's finished. So it's like a, it's like a, a trajectory into the unknown. And and similar to how uh, how she, she was talking about writing as well, and and um, how that unravels as well. I mean, I think it's incredible to look at how um, fluidly she not only um, <clears throat> went between languages and geographies, but media as well. And one of the things I was struck by um, is uh, her reference to uh, translation as transportation. Um, and this is something I'd like to ask all of you as, again, as writers <clears throat> who are working across geographies and languages, um, how did you, or how do you connect to this idea of, of translation as transportation that she has addressed? Um, well, I loved hearing this story about um, it tells what you know, working on those accordion books, because one of the things I always remember about her is that she always just dove into whatever the next thing was, you know, she wanted to write a novel, she wrote a novel, she felt like writing a play, she wrote a play. And we actually had this conversation after that play was written and staged, I think someone invited her to write it um, called um, uh, Crime d'honneur. She, you know, she wanted me to write one. She said, oh yes, you must, you must write a play, you know? And I was thinking like, I don't wanna write a play. <laughs> Why are you trying to convince me to write a play? But it was just, she'd had fun doing it. And so she thought, why shouldn't we do it? You know, I think the creative process for her was natural. It didn't matter what it was. If, you know, compared to the way that I think it's the, it's our residual, you know, um, enslavement to the capitalist system that we labor under, but we think, oh, I am a poet, or I am an essayist, or I am a fiction writer. We don't think of ourselves as just creative people who can do whatever we feel like. We can make dance, we can, you know, paint or take pictures or, you know, do whatever occurs to us. And I think she had a playfulness about things. I do remember the first time I was at that apartment, the first time um, when I was about to leave, she said, no, no, I have something to show you. And we went into her bedroom, she took me into her bedroom and she opened the drawer of the dresser, the top drawer of the dresser where, you know, I think probably most people keep their undergarments there. I mean, I know I do, but her, the top drawer of her dresser drawer was full of, I mean, and I mean full packed with the little, the little accordion books. And she started pulling them out and showing me this one and that one. And so Omar, you mentioned the, um, the ones that were drawings. She was showing me ones that were cities um, that were like cityscape. So she had Sausalito and 
the water and then San Francisco by the time you opened it all the way out. And she had Paris and she had Beirut. She had all these different cities. So I don't know what somebody has those right now. I hope eventually they do get published, but I've seen some in the catalogs, but there are many, many, I can attest to the fact that there are countless more of those somewhere in her apartment in Paris. That's not an answer to your question. I'm sorry, but I, I felt like I wanted to add that. Oh, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> I love this idea of translation as transportation, especially mm -hmm. as someone who, like, I don't, I didn't grow up learning. I didn't learn Arabic growing up. And so it's something that I've like tried to learn as an adult and is like an ongoing process and challenge for me. And I also really relate to her origins as a journalist and thinking of myself as a documentary poet. And I love thinking about like translating source documents and data and dense material that is kind of unreadable to many people into a language of poetry that is more is more easily able to be encountered and read and um, has a wider reach. And I just love that as like an idea of translation. And in the last few years, I've been experimenting because of my struggle with trying to learn Arabic. I've been experimenting with writing in English, but from right to left and a different type of syntax emerges when I do these experiments. And also another thing that's interesting about it for me is I'm left-handed. So it feels very natural to do this physically, like in my body. And so that's, I feel like- Interesting. When um, Amar was talking about painting in Arabic as a, a way to kind of move through not being like a fluent writer in Arabic is really resounding with me. Interesting. And Omar, you're, you're are a translator. Um, and, and in many ways, that's how you encountered her work, correct? Yes, I plead guilty, though I haven't translated in a while. Um, I wasn't familiar with with Etel saying this about translate, translation as transportation, but it strikes mm -hmm. me as something that is in French, I mean, translation, the word, if you take it, if you, your translation in French is traduction. But translation, which would be a, a false um, homonym in a way, like, you know, the same word in French, translation is transportation, is like moving something from a place to another. And there may be something to that. It makes me think of, um, you know, of, of the way translation has functioned in her work, um, and especially with regard to Arabic as, as a way of um, I mean, as a way of transporting her work into Arabic literary communities that maybe because she was writing in French and in English, um, you know, belonging to them wasn't necessarily as obvious to her. Um, I feel like reading something of a, a passage from this book is it always struck me uh, and maybe it answers some of the questions. It's, it's in this book, Master of the Eclipse which is a book of, essentially a book of short stories. I mean, Kazim was, was saying something about the, the genres of, of Etel's writing. And to me, you know, each book invented its genre almost. Like if you look, this is a book of short stories. She wrote plays, Sit Mary Rose is a novel. Um, there are books of lyric, you know, series of lyric poems like The Spring Flower's Own or The Indian Never Had a Horse. There is some kind of wildly experimental work uh, with uh, line breaks, as in the book called Insomnia, or a book that merges the poetry and these hieroglyphic signs in the Arab apocalypse. I mean, every book is kind of um, is kind of an experiment in a way, in in the way that Kazim was saying. You know, she was always ready to jump into the next thing, and so this book is is a book of short stories, and this one is kind of autobiographical. Uh, the title story of this book is called Master of the Eclipse. It's a long it's a longish story. And, it's, and it talks about an Arab poet that she knew, an Iraqi poet called Buland, Buland al-Haydari, who was a very striking kind of presence and who was a more or less an exact contemporary of Etel's. And he comes to her in a dream and she thinks back on when she encountered him in certain poetry festivals and all of that. And, and, um, and so uh, she says, the man whose ghost is visiting me tonight in my California room has died in London. So she tells the story of how he died alone and, you know, an alcoholic and all of that. And then she says, 
um, the ghost is telling me that the best burial we can perform for a friend is to tell the story. And so she tells the story. In the middle of the 70s, I went to Baghdad to participate in a gathering of painters and poets. The visit introduced me to a space where the Tigris predominated. Rose-colored mud streaming alongside the waters were mixed with fragments of sky. I spent my days contemplating that phenomenon while nights were filled with festivities. The continuum of pure time had embarked us along its flow. Spring easily becomes mythical in Iraq. The breeze pulls out of the subsoil the first flowers of the ever-present desert. Gods spring out too. There were many parties all around town. Small groups met in modest houses, harboring musicians, poets, painters, all living legends. One evening, when I went to hear a famous Oud player, a dozen or so young men were already there, and it turned out that they were all poets. Animated conversations were rising above the heavy clouds of tobacco smoke. Through that bluish fog, I heard poetry recited, one voice after another until the youngest rose and a train of words went through the room and over the land and on the uncharted surfaces of our souls. Those poems put us all, it seemed, in a trance because after a while the whole room stood and the men started to dance in circles. They danced and at the end the oud player joined us and we were all turning without a break, without a sound. The next day, there was one more reception, this time a dinner for some 200 people. The young man sitting next to me on my right was none other than the flamboyant young poet that I had heard sing the night before. He asked me if I felt well received in Baghdad. Without waiting for my answer, he introduced himself as a student of history and added in the same breath that he was primarily a poet and that poetry was all that mattered to him. I was amazed by his extreme beauty and he felt it and smiled most disarmingly when serving some dessert on my plate. With a kind of childish happiness, he declared that he knew some of my poems by heart and followed by reciting with a soft voice something I had written. Here in Baghdad, he informed me, we read all that is published in Beirut. I just proved it to you. And he recited to Etel some of her poetry in Arabic, meaning he recited to her some of her poetry that had been translated at the time in the 60s in Beirut in the journal Sher poetry, that was um, one of the main journals of you know, contemporary poetry in the Arabic language, and that was edited by Yusuf al Khal. And Etel was lucky in her translator. She was in, in Arabic, she was translated by some of the major voices of Arabic poetry. I mean, Adonis translated some Etel, Yusuf al Khal translated some Etel, even Darwish translated some Etel. So there is this, uh, and so her work circulated in that way and transported her into these circles that, to her surprise, already knew her through translation. Wow. <clears throat> um, I want to uh, talk a little bit also about. Um... Uh, not just the, the the traveling of her work through the translation, but the, the fact that she was also, um, uh, she's, that she dedicated her life to solidarity. And in, in your um, essay, Omar, you refer to her as, as, as radical equality. Um, and so I'm curious if, if the three of you can speak a little bit to either how that comes through in her texts, um, I know that she <clears throat> she um, uh, she expressed solidarity with a lot of movements. I mean, already Omar, you talked about the fact that she stopped writing in French uh, because of uh, colonial uh, French colonialism in Algeria. Um, but what are some other ways in which that kind of came through for 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 you in in um, you know um, relating to her work uh, or or in working with her, her, her texts or, or, or art. Um, certainly, you know, her writing of Sit Marie Rose, I think was um, incredibly um, powerful moment for her that 
changed and redefined her writing. Um, you know, this book set in a society that, you know, kind of fell, you know, into civil war between people who'd been friends and people who knew each other, people who had been neighbors. And that's why it's so powerful. If you've, if you've read it, it has two halves that are not directly related to each other. They kind of break. I mean, you have this first half that is this very, um, you know, almost cheerful kind of story of this group of friends that are all planning to make a film together and they want the this you know woman who is a writer to kind of write their scenario for them and um it's this you know it could be uh like a, a little romantic <laughs> a romantic film of some kind and then the second half of course the war has begun and there's this horrible um you know the kidnapping of this woman who is um, Christian, but is smuggling medical supplies into Muslim communities. So she's she's apprehended as a traitor. She's a, a, a school teacher, and um, it's a kind of a Greek chorus of the people who have kidnapped her. This seven, I, I think I can't. It's been a little while since I've read this book. Seven men who have kidnapped her, and they each have these monologues, and and it goes in cycles. So you know and and some of the men have the same names as the men who were in the, the friendship group at the beginning and you, you're not really clear uh, it's not 100 percent clear that they are the same men one can assume that they are or that they are it's an, an you know an analogy of some kind that um that it can be anyone in the society that has fallen apart under duress of the civil war so it really is kind of a it's a horrifying book it's very difficult to read um it is violent, of course, naturally. Um, and she really, really, you know, she paid the price on that book for writing it too. As somebody who was from a mixed family, um, uh, her mother was Greek, her father was Turkish. Um, and um, it was, you know, even in Paris, she would talk about how um, she would go to these, gatherings of people she said she went to this gathering and this man was very rude to her and she sort of didn't know why and then he came up to her in a when she was sort of in a corner like there was a lull in the conversation and he came up to her and said you you wrote a book against us you know meaning sit marie rose so it was almost you know I mean, I think Rushdie was in more direct danger, direct and obvious danger, but she was known in, in circles for having written this book that was deemed, um, you know, like against the, the against quote unquote, the Lebanese Christians, because the, of course the Christian men are the villains in this book because they, they murder this woman, spoiler alert, they murder, uh, they murder Marie Rose for, um, for, 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 you know, betraying them or something like that. And so she was always, always, you know, really, really strongly opinionated about the various different things that were happening. I mean, of cities and women, of course, is being written against the backdrop of, of the 1990-91 invasion of Iraq and aerial bombardment of Iraq. Um, she remained concerned and, and, and a strong, strong advocate for Palestinian solidarity with, you know, radical and uncompromising anti-Zionist politics um, her entire, uh, entire life. She never, she never gave one inch on that. Um, you know, she hated the Oslo Accords, uh, as, as many people did, including Darwish. And, um, you know, I think she really, really um, modeled what it was like to to be a writer in a in a in a complicated and hostile world, um, and she she you know particularly in terms of the European um, colonial incursions in the Arab world that are present tense. You know, there it's not um, it's not uh, from the past, and she was always she always held that in her work. I mean, Omar, you said something in your essay that was really striking in relation to that, where you said she has her way of looking apocalypse in the eye. Yeah. Um, well, she was not afraid. Etel was somebody who was fear, you know, in her way, you know, she was this small person and this beautifully um, a childish person at times. You know, she had this twinkle in her eye. She had kept 
through the end of her life, this capacity to wonder at life. I mean, to have a meal with her was a joy because suddenly she was so focused on what she was eating and drinking that everything else seemed to vanish. And it was just a simple, pure joy in the enjoyment of life. Um, and so, but at the same time, she was, um, yeah, she was fearless in terms of, of her politics. For instance, uh, one of the anecdotes that comes to mind now is when she, uh, so she, you know, I said earlier that she came to the U.S. to do a PhD, which she ended up not finishing or deciding to drop, but she did become a professor uh, for 14 years at Dominican College um, between 58 and 72. And one of the main things she was teaching was aesthetics, the philosophy of art. She was a professor of philosophy. And um, and she and she said that she realized very early on that her students didn't know what was going on in the world, weren't interested in current events and weren't reading newspapers. So she decided that as part of the course on aesthetic philosophy, everybody needed to read the paper every day. Um, so there was this this idea that you have to face you know the world as it is. Like at some point, I think it is in the in the of cities and women she says um uh, that she you know she says i know that seeking political and philosophical notions in the street is like trying to construct a barrier to hold back the ocean but i won't look elsewhere so this idea of of course she's somebody who's read a thousand books and who could talk about nietzsche all night long if if and, and love to do that but it it couldn't she never divorced it from uh politics and from the world and so and also what I would add is that she had always known the apocalypse in a way, like from before she was born. I mean, she was born from the relationship between a Syrian man who was an officer in the Ottoman army mm. and who was at the time stationed in Smyrna, where her mother was from, her mother being a Greek a Christian. So the basically this was uh, they were they both represented enemy um peoples or factions in that place and the 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 ottomans destroyed smyrna at the time so it could have destroyed the relationship but her parents somehow you know their love was stronger and they remained together and they, but they had to leave and and that's why she was born in beirut so she was born in beirut to two people who were exiled whose worlds were finished both of them you know she always said that that smyrna had been destroyed her mother had lost her her childhood paradise and the ottoman empire was no longer so her his her father who was this army man also had lost his world so, so she grew up with people who were completely out of place where they were when she was a child mm -hmm. and it's like um it's like she had always had a notion of what the the end of the world was, and she witnessed many en the ends of many worlds in a way. So it was not something that she could ignore or look away from, uh, which which is maybe what I meant by she she looked the apocalypse in the eye. Right. Well, and and I think you also mentioned that. Um... Uh, she's allowing herself to be carried along despite the certainty <clears throat> of apocalypse. Um, so it's like working through those, working through those conflicts. Yeah. And I think part of that is also what you, what you were discussing a minute ago about solidarity. I mean, the example of St. Mary Rose is, is a central one, you know, of like, and, and I think Etel probably identified with Mary Rose, who was a real person. This book was written from uh, something. I mean, she, she was she knew this person kind of not closely but she knew mary rose bulos and she read in the paper sometime after the beginning of the of the civil war in 75 the story of the abduction of mary rose and her killing because she had decided to to be in solidarity with the palestinians even though she was a christian lebanese so this idea of the imperative of uh, solidarity even if it means betraying your, you know, people or cause or whatever it is, is it was always kind of central. Um, I, and I think the knowledge of this, the fact of growing up in Beirut, of 
witnessing the war and all of that. Um, uh, even before that, I mean, it, I mean, I think that this this is something that was in her consciousness from the beginning because, and I think her her knowledge and her involvement or engagement with the Palestinian question is something that had an effect on how she understood the United States when she moved into the United States. I mean, there was always something in her mind that was very clear about uh, the U.S. as a settler colony because she identified, you know, Native Americans with Palestinians, for instance. There was, there was something, this comes up here and there in her work, um, the things she wrote about, um, about Native communities and about landscapes as, um, of course, the beautiful landscape of the mountain. But when she looked at the mountain, and this is apparent in her book, Journey to Mount Temelweis, she's also looking at a territory that has been uh, taken away from its people mm -hmm. at a certain point. So she's also talking about, um, about it as a beautiful landscape that is nonetheless, that nonetheless bears the traces of, a mass, of massacres, essentially. Yeah, I mean, the mountain becomes a prominent theme in a lot of her, her visual work. And as I understood it, this mountain was the view, of, uh, she had a view of this mountain from her home. Is that correct? Um, and and so the, the theme of the mountain, also the theme of the Mediterranean um, appeared a lot in her visual work. Um, and addressing this idea, I mean, her, her visual work is predominantly landscape paintings, abstracted with a uh, void of human. Um, but addressing these very political narratives that that you're you're talking about, correct? Um, and I was wondering if um, if the three of you could talk a little bit about actually how um, the literary and visual work actually come together, um, but specifically through these themes of nature and geography. It's a great question. Uh, I think a lot of the between the writing, the poetry, prose, hybrid work, plays, and the paintings especially are grappling with this question of scale and trying to rectify something that's like larger than human life, like mountains and sea and something as large and violent as war with um, being able to be read or viewed from the perspective, from a human perspective, from like a singular against like a large magnitude things. And some of her later work, especially, there's a lot of um, themes around climate and stuff where we're thinking about like, oh, these things that we have seen for a really long time as everlasting and like far beyond, living far beyond us, like may, that may not be the case any longer um, due to you know climate destruction and things like that. And I wanted to say one more thing about St. Marie Rose, which was when I first read it, it felt like such a breath of fresh air because the language is so direct and it has the whole book and the whole work has such teeth and it's it's delivering this very complicated critique of the war and torture and how things like solidarity with Palestine and, and something like delivering medical supplies is met with such violence from the oppressor and I mean, for me, St. Marie Rose is like the gold standard of like wanting to talk about like how to talk about politics in, in writing. And I also in general love that like when she's she's aligned with a lot of political movements like Omar and uh, Kazan have pointed out and it's all very rich and complicated. It's not in any way like sloganeering or anything like that. Like she's really thinking about things and it comes back to this idea that Cosm brought up earlier that her ideas are never fixed. They're always evolving. She's always like deepening her thinking and her um, her politics around everything. And on that note, Andrea, I think it'd be great if you could read your contribution to um, the journal. Of course. So my poem in the journal is called Aftershock of the Earth Fracturing. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just jumping. There we go. Oh, there it is. Now, not more than ever. Now, as in always. Now, as in history. We are challenged to swallow the magnitude in all directions of wartime death 
Never a single concentrated strike, often unpiloted, arrayed, networked over entire regions of the earth simultaneously. By war, I mean now, and by death, I mean all those that bubble up from buried deep in marrow, shadows caught in the back of my throat, all the shadows that stretch out the lines in my skin I never thought I would get, not because I'm vain, but because I thought for sure I wouldn't make it this far out here, not because I didn't, don't want to, obviously the world would end before now. It's spinning iron core shuttered and frozen, magnetism wanes as the atmospheric shield exhales. In finality, we get bombarded with space trash. In finality, the war continues on as it always has. You think of death as a kind of silence, or I think you think of death as a kind of silence. The cracks of mountains sucked dry by venture capitalists and oil tycoons perpetually in bed with Magal security systems. I wonder who watches their live feed and still says, still stays silent. The oceans are loaded with sea fence dragnet and ocular plastic. The pH drops in the runoff cascade from all the bodies. Oceans acidify and dig teeth into shore edges. I search for what the pH is supposed to be and come up with how long it takes for a body to decompose at sea. Thank you. I would love for you to elaborate on, on um, how this is your, uh, about the, this being a tribute for Atel Adnan. Yeah, I wanted to, so like I said, um, St. Marie Rose was really the first work that I read of hers and made a huge impact on me. And I wanted to write this piece kind of in between St. Marie Rose and her last book, Shifting the Silence, which is very like meditative and aphoristic and um, thinking about you know, her imminent death and also looking at the sea. And there's some themes around um, mountains and sea and like the magnitude of nature and also how war is degrading all of those things. And it, it's kind of this complex um, place to write from because it's like these things of natural beauty, which she obviously loves so much and are being like affected by this thing that she's been trying to fight her entire life. And so I'm kind of writing from those places and um, it's, it's a prose poem, obviously. And so I wanted to kind of inhabit a lot of some of her like later work, um, especially like the hybrid forms that she works with. And um, let's see what else. Yeah, I wanted to complicate the vision of the ocean and have the war and the effects of war like rub right up against the ocean, like literally bodies at sea and kind of explore the uh, the aftermath of what that could look like, like literally, like how it affects the ocean and bodies at sea um, mm -hmm. decrease the pH and acidify the ocean. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is dealing with these really difficult, uh, bleak topics, but one of the things that emerged a lot in, in the tributes um, um, that so many people wrote about her um, was that she was also often honoring love as a concept. <clears throat> and um, I love that she could talk about such bleak things and violent things as war. Um, and yet somehow the predominant thing that comes forward is this idea of love. And I, and I would just, just wanted to know if you had any if any of you had anything to say about that. It's a big question. <laughs> I mean, I love that she, I mean, she has such an amazing community around her. And I also from a personal place, I love that she was a lesbian and had like, queer love in her life. And that makes me really happy. <laughs> Yeah, she was kind of magical in terms of the way that she approached the world. Um, that's one of the things that comes through in in her in all of her work, but in particular, I'm thinking of of cities and women, which were the the letters that she was writing to her friend. And so many things are happening in the external world as she writes, but she really just returns over and over again to the to this friendship that she has with this person, Fawaz, who she's writing to, you know, um, it's just really cool. She was very genuine. She was very present. And um, Omar mentioned this about her too. She just took pleasure in things. She really did. It has to do also with 
you know, a certain capacity, not everybody has it of like being in the present, you know, like be, it, it would go and sit with Etel and she's there fully entirely with you and with <laughs> the other people around, if there are other people around. <laughs> um, I remember th thinking about it for um, so, some years ago, I was, was asked to write something in relation to Etel and I was, and I, and I wrote a, a little piece about Etel and tell as a reader because she's somebody who it's interesting it's not I don't think anything that she wrote has any footnote but it's all infused with reading and sometimes references to authors and all of that and there's a number of names that come back but there's also but it's it's a lot of names and so she's read so many books in so many genres and she was she had this uh, in California, she and Simon were part of these reading groups where they would read philosophy with other poets, et cetera. But, um, and the reason I mentioned this is that it was, it was always fascinating to just sit and listen to Etel's stories. It could be biographical stories of like her, you know, spending time with Nina Simone in Beirut for the Baalbek festival in the early seventies or like, you know, just the most incredible, <laughs> stories that would that that and there were always more of them so I don't know how many lives she lived but and at the same time so so I would just for me you know the, the prize the 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 beauty and the pleasure was just to listen to it tell but what what I realized is that she's also listening she's also always listening because uh at and and at many moments in, in the years that I've known her, she would recommend a book to me, but but I would realize after reading the book in question that it would, was never like a random recommendation, that it was really a recommendation for me. And so there's a bunch of books that she's had me read that have had a huge impact or that changed something in my life um, and that seemed very specific. So, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's love, I mean. In fact, I love that she says, and I'm not sure I wonder if I got this from your text or where I got it, but that she says the story is always superior to theory. Um, because she just seems like an amazing storyteller. And it's very clear that that has impacted all of you. Um, yeah, and I mean, you mentioned Master of the Eclipse, which is a book of short fiction from Interlink. And she did not really work in that form a great deal, you know, most of her books are, are, are you know, there's Simari Rose that is the one and only novel and then Master of Eclipse might be the only collection of short fiction, I'm not really sure. Yes, um, I think so. she, was a, she was a great writer of short fiction. I mean, those stories are really, really excellent. So um, she, she could really do anything. I mean, she had a way, her text had a way of of always having there is something lyrical in them and something philosophical in them and something narrative in them, right? Like all of those things and come together, be it in the poems or in the prose or in the essays, the essayist, the more essayistic texts. There, there, there's never, the genres are not kind of these uh, locked up modes of writing. Well, and right. clearly her, her visual work is also having a similar impact, even though it became relatively more well known in the last years, the last ten years of her life, um, but it but it continues to to have an impact as we know. I um, want to thank. Actually, can I say Sorry. something very quickly about about directly? Yes, about absolutely. That? Because I think that the reputation that Atella Adnan has now, and that people who know know her work on such a scale in terms of that 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 renowned, I guess you would call it, with the wide audiences there are for her work now, that is not what she had for most of her artistic life. I mean, she was producing this whole time, but people did not really know her paintings that much. Not, I mean, mm -hmm. some people did, but not, not really until 2013. And mm -hmm. with her writings, she was always only published by Post Apollo Press, which again was a press run by Simone Fatal, who was her partner. I mean, she was not being published by the major independent presses of the day or the not major independent presses of the day, let alone the big commercial presses. I mean, she was really, really ignored for most of her life as a writer, but she kept doing it. She completely believed in herself. She was a, you know, cult, she had a cult following. There were always people who were very devoted to her, but it was not, she did not have broad audiences 
Um, really, it was not until the Documenta, of course, and then uh, until Nightboat Books started publishing, bringing her work to a much broader audience. Now she is really known as an artist, as a writer. Her paintings command, you know, you know, the exp they're expensive now. Um, but she had to do most of her artistic production. She had to do without that accolades, without support. You know, they worked and they had to, the two of them, and Simone gave up a lot to do it. Um, so it's, you know, it's a parable of sorts to believe in oneself as an artist, to do that work and to support those types of institutions. The, the, the most interesting work, it's being supported by the small independent presses, no matter what country you're in. Right. Yeah, well, and it also just is a testament to how devoted and how much she believed in what she was doing and, and that it wasn't affected by the art market because the art market came um, so much later. Um, and I think late. one of the things, I'm sorry? They were late. Yeah, much too late. <laughs> Yeah, but um, I, I want to thank you all so much for um, for relaying these lovely stories and insights on um, your experience and your relationship with Etel Um I think one of the really beautiful things that, that struck me about the outpour of um, tributes that came out last year on her passing um, is, first of all, how poetic, how... how um, it, it, she inspired such poetic writing from others, um, but that also um, everyone seems so adamant about relaying the fact that um, her presence is still very much felt. Um, and this is evident by the things that the three of you have been saying. So I'd like to thank you again for contributing to this in, in very important issue. Um, and we're honored to have your voices and um, your stories. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much.